Hello, I'm Omar, and uh, along with Jonathan, I'll be presenting our sort of novel CRISPR enzyme discovery work in engineering for both diagnostics and transcriptome engineering. Uh, so uh, to get started, you know, a lot of our work uh, sort of looks at uh, harnessing natural diversity uh, to find new enzymes and things that bacteria or other organisms have developed that we can uh, apply into new tools. And um, there's a really big precedence for this from restriction enzymes from muffler cloning to uh, uh, sort of CRISPR for gene editing as well as viral vectors and a lot of other uh, technologies. And so um, in our work, uh, when we were starting out uh, many years ago, uh, within the CRISPR uh, realm, uh, Cas9 was kind of the biggest uh, sort of single effector tool that people uh, were lo looking at, but it was only a small slice of sort of, sort of diversity of CRISPR enzymes. And um, we wanted to ask the question of whether there was a way to expand uh, this diversity. And so uh, to do that, we uh, looked at signatures of common CRISPR systems. And um, one of the main signatures is this uh, presence of Cas1 and Cas2, which are the uh, proteins responsible for CRISPR memory. Um, and of course, you could also use CRISPR arrays or other sort of highly conserved features of CRISPR systems. Um, but we focused in on Cas1 and Cas2. Uh, and we built a computational pipeline with collaborators uh, such as Eugene Kunin, uh, to look for new systems. And we could use this Cas1 to blast many contigs uh, across you know, hundreds of thousands of bacterial genomes. You find new proteins that are nearby Cas1. You can cluster them and build out new candidate systems. Now, we found many different types of systems when we did this, uh, including CPF1, which is a type 5 A's here, um, which were DNA targeting. And we also could find uh, sort of RNA targeting systems as well, which is a C2C2. Uh, type 6 system, which is very interesting to us because it looks very different than other known single effector CRISPR systems because of its RNA domains. We did a lot of work to characterize this system as a programmable RNA targeting system, which uh, could actually be used to defend against uh, RNA phages or DNA phages when they express their transcripts, and those can be targeted. And we showed that it generated many cuts in the uh, sort of RNA genome. It could even degrade uh, the RNAs with time. Now, one of the really interesting features of this system is not only would it degrade the target it's bound to, but it would also degrade any other RNAs in solution. So once the protein bound, it would have a lot of promiscuous activity in other RNAs. Um, we could actually interestingly leverage that for uh, actual technology purposes. So uh, if you make a cleavage reporter that has a fluorophore quencher on each end, these dumbbell-shaped reporters can actually be cleaved by the collateral activity upon the presence of a target RNA. And so uh, we, we tried this out, and uh, we actually could get fluorescent detection with this approach, uh, but it wasn't super sensitive. So detection was down to maybe you know, millions of molecules per microliter, so the you know, sort of high femtomolar, uh, low picomolar range. Um, and so we thought of ways to make this really sensitive uh, for you know, actual clinical applications where you might want to detect one to 10 copies of something per microliter. So we developed this uh, tool, which we ended up naming Sherlock and had to engineer uh, what the acronym would actually be for that. Uh, but basically it could take DNA or RNA um, and you feed it into a preamplification reaction such as RPA shown here. And that could amplify a lot more DNA uh, along with transcription handles, which allow us to make it into RNA, which could then be detected by the CRISPR systems. And all of this can happen in one reaction, which is really nice. Uh, so CAS13 detection is shown here where you really don't get detection below uh, sort of the peak molar high femtomolar range, but with Sherlock and amplification, uh, we actually could get down to single molecule level detection or low atomolar, um, and same with uh, DNA. So both RNA and DNA worked well here. And we're pretty excited about all the other places we can take sort of CRISPR diagnostics, um, you know, of course, for uh, infectious disease, as well as point of care and at-home detection and genotyping as well. Um, and I think this is really uh, relevant uh, in today's time uh, where we're all, you know, maybe working from home and uh, trying to make it through a pandemic. Uh, I think, you know, early on back in January, uh, we sort of uh, teamed up along with Fung's group uh, to make Sherlock even better. 
uh, and make CRISPR detection even better to make it more relevant for at home or point of care COVID detection. Um, and the way we did that is we wanted to uh, really make the one step Sherlock that all, where all the pieces work in one tube a lot better and faster. Um, so we're actually able to engineer hotter uh, Cas12 enzymes uh, that work in a in concert with a lamp instead of RPA, and we can run the whole reaction at 60 degrees. And some of these hotter Cas12 enzymes, you know, they have to be able to work in this 60 degree range, and we're able to find them from bacteria that actually grow in like rotten fruit juice. Uh, and so this new master mix is really great because then you can take a swab or saliva. Um, basically do a quick extraction, add it to this reaction, and then just do a 60 minute incubation if you want lateral flow detection, or we've got 20 to 30 minute detection if you do real time fluorescence on like a simple portable device. Um, and that's been really exciting. And the lateral flow detection has actually been very good on uh, a wide range of clinical samples with low and high viral loads shown here. We can get about 97% detection. Um, the top line indicates detection, so most of the positive samples have detection, and the five negative samples uh, do not. And that corresponds to about 97% sensitivity, 100% um, specificity when you look across our whole data set. And, uh, and that's, you know, kind of uh, what we're really excited about for CRISPR diagnostics is really moving that forward. You know, we have this really great optimized master mix now, which we call STOP, uh, stands for Sherlock Testing on One Pot. And we're kind of excited where we can maybe take this, maybe on a simple device is kind of what we're thinking these days about. Uh, you know, having an all-in-one sort of system that can run this chemistry and be deployed in any setting. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll have more on that in the future. Uh, now, CAS13 also, interestingly, is not just useful for diagnostics. Um, there's a lot of cellular applications that we can start to think about, and RNA, of course, is involved in so many different processes in the cell. So having tools to manipulate RNA is important. Um, and you know, two things you can do with uh, program RNA targeting tools of the many things you could do is RNA knockdown and base editing. Um, we've talked a lot about in the past for RNA knockdown, but I think the base editing stuff is more uh, interesting and more recent. So uh, I'll dive into that a bit. Um, but basically, you know, big question is why RNA editing when DNA editing is so great? Well, you know, there's a lot of applications that uh, could benefit from temporal modulation, um, you know, modulating protein function if you want to turn something that's active, inactive, or inactive to active. An example of that is turning on like hepatocytes or heart cells in cases of, you know, liver failure or heart failure, um, or, you know, even just modulating the immune system or modulating pain. Um, correction mendelian diseases can also be done, um, which is useful. Um, as well as splicing modulation. And it's really useful for mutations that you want to correct that you're not sure if you want permanent correction or also don't want to worry about uh, permanent off targets as well. Um, so there's a lot of uh, applications for RNA editing. Um, and uh, I think it's really cool that um, how, how we can take advantage actually of the of uh, natural processes. So we basically uh, can make an RNA editing tool by uh, sort of recruiting natural enzymes that already occur in the cell, such as ADR enzymes, which convert adenosine to inosine. And so um, I think that's a pretty good intro, and I'll pass it on to Jonathan now, um, who can actually sort of talk about our, our work in this space and uh, you know, what we've been doing uh, with programmable RNA editing tools. Great. Thanks so much for that great introduction. So. I'll share my screen here. So as Omar mentioned, RNA editing essentially can be done by a suite of enzymes in the cell. Um, most notably, one of them is ADAR, or adenosine deaminase acting in RNA. And we can actually engineer RNA editing by using the ADAR-DD, the deaminase domain. We can fuse it with the catalytically inactivated Cas13B. And we can pair that with a guide RNA with a specific mismatch in it. So this mismatch can signify the target adenosine um, with a mismatch cytosine here. Then we can actually target it to a specific adenosine and the ADR DMNA domain will convert that to an adenosine. So we call this repair or RNA editing for programmable ADI replacement. And here's an example of repair. So this is on a reporter transcript, a cryptidine luciferase, where we have a pre-termination construct here. Um, it, this uh, tryptophan we've converted to a stop codon. So by putting this uh, different base here, this cytidine opposite of it, we can actually evoke RNA editing. And this is a tiling of guides across it. And you can see that this uh, 
specifically edited uh, target can be quite efficiently edited um, by a number of guides, getting editing rates um, up to uh, 25%. So one thing that we wanted to make sure was that we had a great specificity of this tool. So if we do genome-wide or such as transcriptome-wide sequencing and look for RNA editing events compared to um, without the chemistry, you can see that our uh, Cupertino actually we can get um, by this readout um, up to 90% editing, but we have off targets across the transcriptome. So we thought to ourselves, how can we actually do rational improvement of the technology to prevent editing across at these unexpected and un, uh, desired sites? So what we did is we took uh, rational design via structural information. So this is a uh, schematic from Peter Beal's lab where we essentially we can identify interacting residues of the ADR deaminase domain, and then we can mutagenize them so they both retain activity, so this is the on-target score, but have increased specificity as well. So we want something with a high on-target and specificity score. So we use it to develop a repair v2 construct that is much more specific across the transcriptome. So here's that uh, Manhattan plot to repair v1 before. And then here you can see with repair v2, we essentially have an elimination of all of these off-target editing sites across the transcriptome. Here's uh, just a zoom in at the actual CLUX site. So we have essentially the um, editing here at this desired uh, adenosine, and you can see it converted to Gs via inosine, but there's all these off targets. Then when we actually introduce these mutations, we only have our, our pure product. So this can also be applied to a number of sites. So we can do editing on targets such as KRAS, and you can see here we have um, above 30% editing with repair v1, and we take a small, small decrease with repair v2, but that allows us to not have off target edit, editing across the other sites um, in KRAS. So this is great, but we thought that how can we engineer the enzyme in the system to be even more um, powerful? So one thing, of course, is that A to I editing allows you to make a certain set of restorative or in a function mutations, as Omar mentioned. But what would be really fantastic would be a system that allows us to have uh, editing of additional conversions. So this is CDU editing would allow things like conversion of phosphorylated residues to non-phosphorylated residues. So this begs the question, how do we do CDU editing? So expanding the targeting range of RNA editing was a big interest of ours. So we thought, maybe we can actually perform directed evolution of these AR domains. And we, that's based upon a predicate of, if you see how the ADR domains interact with the uh, pocket, you can actually see in, when there's an adenosine bound, the corresponding cytidine deaminases interact quite well. But the, if you put a cytidine analog in, you can see only a couple of residues actually block the deamination there. So, what we did is we did a direct evolution of ADAR to actually generate a CDU editor. So we took a campaign of rational mutagenesis, much like with repair v2, uh, to nominate some residues and then put that into a direct evolution pipeline where we could use yeast expression of the ADAR um, on an oxytrophic mutant to restore activity. And then we can select mutants there um, that are valid in, in mammalian cells and then iterate that process. So this allows us to make a pipeline of different versions or rounds of selection. So this CDU editor, we call um, a cytidine urine editor or rescue. Um, and it is actually quite uh, an efficient process. So here is another luciferase based reporter. Now it's Gaussian luciferase, but it's a similar concept where we're restoring a mutation. And these multiple rounds of editing actually took us from essentially undetectable levels of editing up to 70% editing of this transcript um, site. Here's a different site. So we do have some variation where we're only getting 4% editing due to a undesirable motif, but you can see still that we get strong amounts of editing and this is dependent on the fusion. So other RNA targeting technologies can um, try to avoid uh, recruitment via CRISPR, but we tested those with our um, mutant uh, the ADR DD mutation. And if you just introduce that alone or as those mutations of the full length protein, they're still not effective at CDU editing. 
So this shows that perhaps we co-evolved it with the CAS 13 to fold it or something. But what we do find is that it's very effective and we can also target a uh, panel of endogenous genes and see quite effective editing up to uh, and above 30% on some targets. Um, and we have confidence that it is transferable to a large number of genes with many different phenotypic outputs. For example, beta-catenin here. So the beta-catenin pathway is involved in wind singling. So phosphorylation of beta-catenin um, leads to its degradation in the absence of wind signaling and the presence of wind signaling. Uh, lack of phosphorylation leads to stabilization and translocation to the nucleus. So what we thought was that perhaps these domains that are either directly phosphorylated or involved in phosphorylation, we can apply the rescue approach to edit them and then prevent phosphorylation. And these phosphorylation dead, dead uh, beta-catenin uh, variants will then be able to signal and do things like increase growth. And this is very interesting because Wnt, the Wnt pathway is a very relevant uh, pharmaceutical target, but it's also something that you need to have very strong control over. So using these pathways and these targets is very easy because, for example, if you deliver the rescue uh, chemistry transiently, it will be diluted out. So what we did is we actually tested guys against beta-catenin, finding guys that could do up to about 30% editing, and using beta-catenin activity reporters or TCF reporters, we can actually see that this leads to a strong up uh, regulation of the pathway. Um, this leads to cell growth. So here, this is an assay where we actually take a plug out of the cells and they grow in. And you can see in the absence of this, they grow in slightly, but in the presence, they grow in actually quite substantially. And to quantify that, you can see we have significant more growth in these situations. So this is only one of the many uh, applications of the rescue platform in RNA editing in general, where we can obviously correct Mendelian diseases or multiplex to correct them using the multiplexing cap capabilities of CAS-13. We can also modulate the catalysis or post-translational states of proteins and do this in a transient fashion. So this allows us to have the uh, precision of genome editing with the uh, kinetics and permanence of more similar to other biologics or even small molecules. So we only scratched the surface of what these RNA binding proteins can do, such as Cas13, inside of mammalian cells. So of course we can modulate translation or splicing or localization, even epitranscriptomics. There have been recent papers using Cas13 for changing the uh, M6A states, for example. And we see this toolbox as a rapidly growing uh, capability maybe not as strong or as uh, fill, full as the Cas9 or DNA targeting toolbox, but the RNA tool, targeting toolbox is certainly getting there. So to take it back one step to where we started, yes, natural diversity has been a rich resource, resource uh, of course, of CRISPR enzymes, but also of other enzymes such as deaminases or other genome modifying enzymes such as integrases or recombinases. So we're very excited about using these and mining these in a a comprehensive manner to find new tools for genome editing and um, translational applications. So as Omar mentioned, uh, we're co-running a lab together at the McGovern Institute now, um, and we're excited about exploring into uh, that natural diversity. We'd also like to thank everybody who was involved with this. Um, much of this work was done in Feng Zhang's lab while we were graduate students, especially with David Cox, um, as well as many other people who contributed um, we're co-founders of Sherlock Biosciences and Advisors for Theme, um, and you can check out our uh, research at abogut.mit.edu. Thanks for listening, and we're happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. <laughs>